Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming here this early to hear about uh, hairy cell leukemia. It's a pleasure for me to be here, and I'm um, delighted and uh, very thankful for the invitation to the organizers. So um, before we start into the therapies and you know, what, what uh, we can achieve, let's go a little bit about the background. Um, in the 1950s, two different groups, one from um, Mayo Clinic and the other from Ohio State, both described independently a condition that was called at the time leukemic reticuloendocytosis. And it established a distinct entity with um, splenomegaly and cytopenias and recurrent infections. In 1966, Shrek and Donnelly reported for the first time peculiar cells, and they called them hairy cells. In 2008, the World Health Organization determined that the classic form of hairy cell leukemia should be recognized as separate from the rare variant hairy cell leukemia V. And in uh, 2011, Dr. Enrico Tiachi and colleagues described for the first time the presence of the BRAF B600E mutation, which is present in the majority of uh, classic hair cell leukemias, but is absent in variant type. In terms of epidemiology and diagnosis, it's a very rare disease, about 900 to 1,000 new cases in the United States per year, only 2% of all leukemias diagnosed. Median age of diagnosis is in their 50s, with a higher incidence in males and um, white. The clinical hallmarks include fatigue and infections. It used to be that most patients presented with massive splenomegaly, but that is no longer the case. As people have, uh, um, nowadays, they see their doctors frequently and they get an annual CBC. In terms of initial evaluation, you should always do a peripheral smear review. And monocytopenia is a very sensitive and specific manifestation of classic heresy leukemia. The differential diagnosis included uh, the variant subtype and other um, indolent B cell malignancies. The flow is very classic. CD19 positive, CD20 positive, CD25, 103, 123, and CD200 positive. In most of the um, disease with classic subtype, you find the BRAF um, mutation. Uh, in order to do a bone marrow aspirate, it's very hard. Most patients have a dry tap. So you actually have to do a trephine um, biopsy. And what you will find is the presence of um, the BRAF and CD20 on the uh, bone marrow. Indications for therapy, most of the patients can be on active surveillance until they present symptoms, which are similar to other indolent lymphomas or leukemias. You just um, follow the patient closely, and if you have any um, symptomatic lymphadenopathy or cytopenia, then you initiate therapy. Historically, the treatment used to be splenomegal, splenectomy or interferon. Interferon had a um, response, but very short-lived, and very few cases had a complete remission. This was changed to a purine analog, and later on, rituximab was included as a frontline, and that's kind of like the standard of care at present. In terms of relapse refractory disease, this is still an admit need. And it is for this reason that there are several new agents in the pipeline that are being in development. In terms of molecular testing, most of the patients have hypermutated IGHV. And the unmutated type is seen more frequently in the patients with the variant um, subtype. IGHV 434 expression is associated with higher disease burden and poorer response to single agent cladribin with a shorter overall survival. VRAF V600 mutation is absent in cases of hairy cell leukemia variant or IGHV434 classic. These are some of the recurrent genetic lesions. And in terms of the differential diagnosis, why is it important? So the variant subtype is very, very um, rare. Some series reported that as low as 10% of typical presentation. The reason why you actually need to find out is because these are the typical patients that won't res don't respond to um, traditional cladribin use. They have a very poor overall response rate, and they should be considered for therapy with a clinical trial or cladribin in combination with rituximab.
these are the um, heresy leukemia guidelines. As you can see, most of the time, you truly don't need to do the molecular testing. But in certain circumstances, when you're entertaining the possibility of a deparian subtype, you should pursue that. In terms of the guidelines, as I mentioned before, you do active surveillance until you have the symptoms. If there's no indication for therapy at the time of the initial diagnosis, you just continue the active surveillance. When the patients have um, the need for therapy, you either use cladribine or pentostatin. Most, patient, most physicians choose to use pentostatin when patients are having a lot of recurrent infections as they can um, titrate the drug easier. Your goal is to achieve a complete remission. And once you achieve that, you observe until indication for treatment. If you aren't able to achieve a complete remission, then you should treat this patient as an early relapse. In terms of relapse refractory therapy, you either retreat with the initial purine analog, plus or minus rituximab, if you relapse after two years of the initial therapy, or you can choose to use the alternative agent, depending on the patient's preferences and your uh, diagnostic criteria. Other physicians, depending on the age and comorbidities, may choose to only use rituximab in these patients, and that is also okay by the guidelines. If you relapse in less than two years, the first recommendation is to send this patient to a clinical trial, because historically, you know that these patients are going to do very poorly. The other option is to treat with an alternative feeding analog, plus or minus rituximab, with rituximab by itself, or with emurafenib. But emurafenib was tried and tested in patients that had a short relapse, uh, just one or two years after the last therapy. And at the time of disease progression, these are the preferred regimens. First, again, the clinical trial, because by the time that you get here, you're a very rare patient, and you should be seen by someone from the Harris and Leukemia Consortium. The second option could be vemurafenib plus or minus rituximab, and the other alternative is moxetumumab plus sudotox. It's a new agent just approved in the fall of 2018. Another um, option could be the use of ibrutinib, and I'll go about these drugs in more detail. In terms of uh, the response criteria, very important, like I said, to try to achieve complete remission because this correlates with a longer progression-free survival. And as you can see, in order to achieve this, you need to get normalization of your counts with a hemoglobin of um, higher than 11, an ANC of higher than 1,500, and platelets over 100,000. In terms of frontline therapy, cladribine and pedostatin historically have been able to achieve, in the vast majority of patients, above 85% a complete remission or an overall response rate with complete remissions that are sustained and with a median PFS of 10 years, as you can see in this paper. The problem is, again, in patients with variant Harris leukemia, the response to therapy is pretty poor independently of which purine analog you choose to use. The ability to achieve your complete remission and median PFS for patients with Harris leukemia decreases with each subsequent line of therapy. This is the reason why you need to do the best bang for your buck. You really want to give the best therapy up front so that your patient can go into remission for a longer period of time. Um, there's a phase two trial from the MD Anderson group where they use cladribine frontline followed by rituximab infusions, a phase two study. And the fellow free survival is um, strikingly, um, as you can see in the graph by the orange hairy leukemia variant graph. These are the patients that will um, relapse earlier, and they will also have a shorter overall survival. In terms of um, patients that were treated with either single agent or cladribine plus rituximab, they reported that patients treated with cladribine and rituximab had a longer flavor-free survival. So, some physicians choose to use the combination with a monoclonal antibody. Here are two graphs. On the left is, again, the same data that I just mentioned from MD Anderson. And on the right is a um, retrospective study of the use of cladribine or pentostatin in combination with rituximab, where the authors reported a complete remission rate of 89%. So it's important to recognize that the addition of the monoclonal antibody rituximab can achieve a deeper response and with that, a longer remission duration. Now, I'm presenting the data for vendamastin and rituximab. This is not an FDA-approved regimen for hairy cell leukemia. This is not in the NCCN guidelines. But still, it's something that is used in the community. And I've seen physicians that use, or patients that have been treated with this regimen. 
So this is based on a phase one trial where six patients were treated with 70 milligrams per meter square and six patients were treated with 90 milligrams per meter square. The author said that they would stick with a 90 milligrams per meter square. And as you can expect, similar to what you would expect with cladribine or uh, pentostatin, the majority of the patients had um, myelosuppression as the most common side effect. The patients that stayed in remission longer were the patients that were able to achieve a complete remission. Now let's move on to targeted therapies. As I mentioned, in 2011, Enrico Tiacci from Italy discovered that most of these patients had the BRAF mutation. That is a driver oncogenic mutation. So the thinking is, if you have an oncogenic driver, why don't we use a drug that is already approved for melanoma and see if it works? And lo and behold, there were two large multicenter studies, one in Europe, one in America, and they both came back with the same response rates, between 96% and 100% in both groups. Um, the complete remission rate with monotherapy was 35% and 42% respectively. And as you can see, after a couple of days of therapy, the villi that are seen under the microscope are, don't, no longer appear just by using the drug, which is given at 960 BID. In terms of how does it affect your, um, hemo your, your counts, the ANC, hemoglobin, and the platelet count goes up over time. It also improves the outcomes in the bone marrow. And what was seen in both, um, mainly in the um, European group, because it was a little bit more mature, is that the patients that were able to achieve a complete remission were able to be in remission for a longer period of time. And they had treatment-free survival that was longer as well. So again, the message is try to achieve a complete remission. In terms of survival and PFS, the overall survival is better and longer um, from other historical components. And as you can see, the percentage of hairy cell leukemia cells in the peripheral blood and in the bone marrow decreases over time with the, with the drug regimen. In terms of toxicities, I know that it's very hard to read, but it's for your slides, so you will get them after the conference. But the most common toxicities to know are the skin toxicities, including rash of photosensitivity. This is, has to be reminded to the patients. They have to actually see a dermatology doctor at least every six months. There's also a chance of developing secondary skin cancers. Also, arthralgias and arthritis, purexia, and increased bilirubin is common. Now, I'm not going to talk into depth with this combination, um, but it's kind of like the new kid on the block, Evomurafenib with rituximab in um, relapse refractory hair cell leukemia, just presented at IHA this summer. And uh, it sounds pretty good. The um, number of patients that was able to achieve a complete remission was 96%. So this was um, a very safe regimen. There were no new um, toxicities found. And more importantly, there's a consideration that maybe at some point, bemurafenib with rituximab in combination could be a good challenger for what has been historically a disease that has been treated with chemotherapy. So maybe this regimen will be the next, you know, um, E1912 trial, which showed that ibrutinib in combination with rituximab was better than FCR in CLL. We don't know, but it's, it's a gutsy uh, consideration. Now let's talk about the other targeted um, kinase that has been approved. It's in the NCCN guidelines for consideration, but it ha this data, data is under review. It hasn't been published yet. It's a phase two study, 28 patients. Uh, last time it was presented was in ASH 2016. And there were two groups, um, patients treated with 420 and 840 once a day. And essentially, patients were able to achieve some sort of response over time, but the responses are very slow. It takes about eight months. Now, I want to bring to your attention the next drug, and this one drug has been approved by the FDA last year. Um, it's a long story um, from the NIH. In 2001, um, it was the first time that it was published that this monoclonal antibody targeting CD22 um, had activity in hairy cell leukemia, and it only took 17 years for FDA approval. But, you know, perseverance is important in medicine. So in the phase one trial, 28 patients with relapsed refractory disease were treated at different doses for up to 16 cycles. And what people saw is that patients that were able to achieve a complete remission had a longer um, time in, re in re and remission. 
Now, if you see from the phase one data, the investigators found that it's very important, if possible, not only to achieve a complete remission, but also a detectable MRD, because this correlates with a longer remission duration. As you can see, the top line on the graph on the left is still in remission if you achieve undetectable MRD. The pivotal study was a phase three trial that had 80 patients with relapsed refractory disease, multicenter, open label, and uh, this study was with the dosage of 40 micrograms per kilogram on days 135 of every 28-day cycle. And what it found was that about 48% of the patients were able to achieve a durable CR. And durable CR was defined as not requiring a transfusion for at least four weeks, and also showing a long-term um, remission duration of more than 120 days. In terms of response rate, about 75 to 79% of the patients responded, with a good number of patients achieving complete remission between 40 and 50, depending on who uh, made the decision. Importantly, again, if you note on the graph on the right, if you are still MRD positive at the end of the treatment regimen, your chances of having a long-term duration are lower than achieving undetectable MRD. So these are the special considerations, um, two. One of them is um, cyto um, the, I'm sorry, capillary leak syndrome, and it's characterized by hypoalbuminemia, hypotension, symptoms of fluid overload, and hemoconcentration. This happened in 34% of the patients at all grades, and only between you know, one and 2% in grade three or grade four. Hemolytic uremic syndrome, um, characterized by macroangiopathic hemolytic anemia, thrombocytopenia, and progressive renal failure, happened all commerce in 7%, with less than 3% in higher grades. But still, something that can be very dramatic, so patients should be adequately um, hydrated prior to any therapy. Now, this slide summarizes the clinical trial data that I have mentioned so far. And in essence, uh, what you can see from these trials is that the addition of rituximab essentially um, increases the achievement of complete remissions. And as such, it should be one of the um, treatment strategies for future um, proposed trials. And with that, I uh, thank you very much for your attention, and I leave you with that uh, comic on hairy cell leukemia. Thank you very much.